now um, to celebrate uh, Red Wheelbarrow and the Red Wheelbarrow Poetry Prize, I'm going to give it over to uh, to Ken, who's right there on my screen. Give it up to Ken Wisner. Yay! Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Rob. And I'm I, I'm trying to share the screen here. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see our dedication to the Red Wheelbarrow there? There it is. So I wanted to read this page. Um, it's a dedication, Adrian Rich, 1929 to 2012 from Natural Resources, The Dream of a Common Language. And Rose Black had found this excerpt and we had done some research so we would uh, print it just right. The passion to make and make again were such unmaking reigns. My heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who age after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. <clears throat> so that's our little dedication. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I felt you know, that way constantly, um, just dealing with everyone this year, students, uh, judges, writers, <laughs> poets. Uh, it's been a wonderful year. Um, I, I wanted to uh, just be fast because we're gonna move on here. We're a few minutes behind. We have kind of a big ship to steer tonight. So um, uh, we do have a lot of art in the magazine. So at some point about halfway through, I'll give a slideshow and I hope our artists are here because there are too many screens and I don't know who's there. Um, that's been a great revelation. I hope you'll get the hard copy of the magazine. Um, you'll certainly get it in your mail before New Year's um, if you ask for it. Uh, those are contributors, get a free one. Um, and you can also purchase extras and I'll put the details in the chat for you later. But it'll be a special book this year with 40 plus pages of beautiful art. Um, and we also have, uh, you know, you'll be hearing from uh, inmates, writer, inmate writers at Salinas Valley State Prison and uh, also our Poetry Prize winners who are from all around the country. And I, I wish we could hang out after and get a beer. I just don't know <laughs> what, what this is all about, this virtual thing, but maybe Rob will leave it open afterwards and we can all chat. So I'm turning it over to Caesar uh, 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 Kent, who is our uh, exquisite MC, and, and he'll be guiding you tonight. There'll be a few other MCs. Caesar, a former student, but now a launched poet and MC himself. And then uh, Cynthia White will also be helping some. And uh, uh, thank you for all the staff and Poetry San Jose for helping us make this book every year. Mm. All I right. I think this is me. Here we are, here I am, here I am. Um, thank you, Ken. And thank you, Robert and Joe. Um, I would normally say welcome to works, but tonight I guess it's whatever works. Um, this is, I've been doing this for three, four years. I'm not sure how long. So you might know me from that or you might not know me at all. This might be your first, our first meeting through Zoom. Um, so yeah, I've been working with Fred Wilbrow for since I think 2014 or 15. Um, and I've been in love with it ever since. And it's something that really helped me launch my poetic career and get involved with a lot of other great poets and meet a lot of great people. Um, but we are in a time constraint. We got a lot of people, we got people up late. So let's just get right into it. Um, we're gonna start with a few of our Eastern time zone poets. Um, and we can ask the real questions. How deep is the snow? How cold is it? And what are you doing up so late? Pause for a laughter. I can't hear your laughter. I wish I could. Um, our first readers tonight will be Robert Fanning, Andrew Gent, and Stephen Cusisto. Um, hey, I'm here. Do you want me to start? Um, yes, spectacular Robert Fanning holds up the poetry world in our Mount Pleasant in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. His two most recent brilliant collections of poetry are Severance and our modern our Sudden Museum. Thank you for being here, Robert, and you may take the stage. Thanks for having me, and uh, so great to be here. Uh, what an honor. Uh, I wouldn't be able to be here um, on the West Coast, so this is one of the good things about Zoom. Uh, it's awesome to be here. It's 35 degrees and dark outside in Michigan right now. No snow, which is hugely disappointing, but I hope it's on its way. 
Um, so I'm right here. We can do this in Michigan. I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty much right in the middle of the state. That's where I'm coming from. Um, thanks to Works. Thanks to Joe and Rob and Ken and Well Red and everybody at Red Wheelbarrow. Um, it's an honor to be in this journal. I just, um, I love the physical feel of Red Wheelbarrow. It's a, it's one of those journals you won't give away, right? It's one that will, um, I will cherish. And uh, I just looking at the PDF, it looks incredible. So much great work and and great artwork too. So. I'm going to read one poem and um, one of the four that they were selected for the issue, which I'm so proud of. And it's a poem called Cocoon. And this is a poem that uh, I spent probably weeks working on. Um, it's got this ridiculously difficult, challenging rhyme scheme. It's a contrapuntal. And that, that, that shouldn't matter to anyone outside of this room. And it probably only matters to you for a minute. But, um, and it might not stick the landing, but I want some points for difficulty. That's all I'm saying. So since it's a contrapuntal, I'll read it um, horizontally and then vertically. This poem is called Cocoon. I am cocoon of a gray flaked gauze I've spun around a threaded flaw, long staked and strewn, my unbound laws, whose frayed seams of their inward wear, whose hems are sure to tear, my web it seems composed of fear, my flaring there of some sheer hymns, heft my unwinding air, is need a flame, a seething glare, for my spider whom I've unsown the cause of this gnawing known by loom and lies is sure to open soon to many eyes. I am cocoon around a threaded flaw whose frayed seams are sure to tear. My flaring there is need of flame. I've unsown the cause is sure to open soon of a gray flaked gauze long staked and strewn of their inward wear, my web it seems, of some sheer hymns, a seething glare, of this gnawing known to many eyes. I've spun my unbound laws, whose hems composed of fear, heft my unwinding air, for my spider whom, by loom and lies, I am cocoon. Thanks for listening, everyone. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta show this one. Can you see Hello, it? Robert. <laughs> can you guys Thanks, see Rosie. that? Can, can you see how I've shared it? Oh, maybe not. Down there. Robert, yeah. did I share it? No. I don't oh. see it. How about, there it is. Oh, there it is. I just wanted to take a few seconds to show what Robert did. Mm. We have three of these, what Dorian calls cleave poems in the, uh, in the book. And I, I just, I was, isn't it astonishing? Okay, that's it. Little interruption. You can't control so, it. Great. You read it both ways, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which way did you start with? You started, you started horizontal. Yeah, I went across the, I guess, the x-axis. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, horizontal first. But it rhymes, um, you know, up and down. It's it was a nightmare to write. So I hope it hope it hope it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rosie. Well, thank you for letting us get wrapped up in that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Robert. Um, our next reader, Andrew Gent, lives again or Gent. Uh, Gent. Gent lives in New Hampshire, where he works as a writer and information architect. His first book, Explicit Lyrics, won the Miller Williams Poetry Prize and is available from the University of Arkansas, Arkansas Press. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for putting this together. This is really a lot of fun, really interesting. Um, I actually, um, I know Ken from years and years ago. I don't think we've actually met for 30 years or more, um, but he's been kind enough to take some of my poems for for the magazine, um, and I'm going to read one of them. Uh, it's uh, as I told Ken, uh, this is a different kind of poem than I normally write, so um, we'll see how it goes in terms of how, reading it. Uh, but it's called Enemy of the People. Um, it goes like this 
I want to be the enemy of the people, the one the president calls out in his State of the Union speech is much, most likely to succeed in burning down illegal walls and putting an end to the persecution of blacks, women, and Hispanics, and all the other bullshit he's selling. Enemy of the people who go along, cheer him on and pretend he isn't a liar. When he says what, he want, what they want to hear and close their eyes when he says things they don't. Yes, I believe in the violent overthrow of bad ideas, sold as patriotism, patriotism, and patriotism sold as an excuse to hurt others. I believe in the Declaration of Independence and the individual's right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not as an excuse to kill black people and brown people and red people, but as a responsibility to protect those rights for each and every one of us, and especially those who cannot protect themselves. I am the enemy of the people who think there isn't enough America to go around, that they must keep their rights to themselves or else someone will take them away. The purists, the privileged, the white slave traders waiting for their ship to come in. They're the enemy ready to gun us down, even white boys like me, because they swear the pen in my hand looks just like a weapon in the darkness they claim is descending on our country as I speak. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, up next, we have Stephen Huslisto, who's off the charts good new book of poetry from Tigers Park Press is titled Old Horse, What is to be Done? He currently teaches at Syracuse University where he holds a profession, professorship in disability studies. Don't miss his creative nonfiction. Don't miss anything he writes. Welcome, Steve. And make sure you're unmuted, my friend. There I am. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, thank you for that lovely introduction. This is just a delight. Thanks all of you for doing this, putting it together. It, it is snowing in Syracuse, New York, where I'm presently living and it's quite cold. So it's uh, got all the people in Syracuse thinking, oh, oh, it's all right, it'll just be another five months. Uh, I'm gonna read one poem from the latest issue of Red Wheelbarrow that I'm lucky to have in the magazine. This is called, A Poem is Some Remembering. Fish scales and barter, I grew up wild, barefoot, Mournful, split, talkative, always talking. Did I mention letters? I wrote them almost daily. I think children shouldn't write letters or have to, but blindness, hospitals, escapes, the trees, one starts early writing to no one. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, one of the three poems that I'm fortunate to have in the latest issue of Red Wheelbarrow. Uh, and now it falls to me in my inelegant and abstruse way to introduce my co-conspirator uh, in the next part of the program, uh, Ralph Savarees. Ralph lives in Iowa City, Iowa. He is a professor at Grinnell College. He is the author of innumerable uh, and important books on disability, uh, on uh, neurodiversity, neurocosmopolitanism, uh, critical studies on thinking about the nature and meaning of reading. Uh, but he's also the author of two brand new books of poems uh, fresh off the press. This is Republican Fathers. Uh, and uh, it came out uh, really, I don't know, let's see, what is this? This is December. Uh, I think this came out in July or August and uh, from Nine Mile Books and, and Magazine. It's uh, rather extraordinary. And then even more recently, this is called When This Is Over. It's a collection of poems written during this pandemic. So while the rest of us have been picking lint out of our bathrobes and moving from one chair to another in sequestration, Ralph has been uh, writing uh, fresh, original and dynamic poems 
So I'm uh, pleased to introduce uh, Ralph. Are you here? I am here, but you're going to read your, we're going to talk a little bit, one minute about our, um, the crazy new book we have coming out next year, where poems in conversation with one another. You want to say something about that? Yeah, so Ralph and I began writing poems back and forth to each other in a kind of a renga process, uh, challenging each other to write fast uh, and to throw off the shackles of too much pre uh, disposition and uh, self awareness. And uh, we took as our model a wonderful book that Marvin Bell uh, and William Stafford uh, did back uh, around 1980 called Segways, where they wrote poems back and forth to each other. And uh, we wound up. <laughs> Uh, with a really rather uh, lively and, um, I have to say, quite unusual uh, <laughs> electrolysis of uh, engaged poems. And uh, we're going to read uh, each a poem uh, from that book. Uh, it's called Someone Falls Overboard. And uh, it will be out uh, sometime, sometime January, February. So this is the first poem in the book. I, I wrote this and sent it to Ralph. It's called In the Middle Distance. Does anyone read Louis Simpson anymore? <laughs> is it time for a smoke? How about Robert Hayden? Where do the poets go? Please say Valhalla. Among the living they're not red, though I can see them through a glass. And others, Ignato, Rukeyser, Thomas McGrath, my old teacher, Don Justice. The living now read clean menus and phones. The poets born early last century had fatigued and ruined hearts, which should not be forgotten for some God truly looked down upon them. I want to stare a little while, blind though I am, as Hart Crane lifts his heavy arms. So that's the I read, it's, it's fantastic. Before I read my poem, I will say that um, I had no idea what I was getting into with Steve because Steve could send you 11 poems in a day and somehow you were supposed to keep up. I felt a little bit like Lucille Ball in that uh, I love Lucy bottle cap uh, episode where where the poems were coming at me. Um, but it was so much fun because it was better than ordinary words. So here's my poem called Scoundrels in response to Steve's. They used to say of a father who left, he went out for a smoke and never came back. Translation, the fucker abandoned us. He didn't leave a dime. It's the same with poets. Every reader is a child and every poem a betrayal. The word moves on. Truth is we nag them to death. Books are like milk bottles. They wait to be opened and spoil quickly. We're all just scoundrels of the moment. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so you can see we had fun. Yeah. Uh, so this is the part where somebody has to introduce the next readers. That's me. And me and <laughs> it's so hard when there's on a stage to see people walking away from or that finished body language. Um, anyway, thank you, Stephen Ralph. We also want to introduce two more local collaborator prov prov provocateurs. I can say words from Santa Cruz, Jory Post and Paula Bruni. Um, maybe poetry collaboration is a new trend, a nice form of inspiring and relating to other poetry soulmates. Ideal for any pandemic, because there'll be more for sure. <laughs> Welcome up, uh, Jory and Paula. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I was asked to just talk a little bit about how this happened. And last summer, Jory and I attended the Catamaran Literary Conference and the wonderful Dorian Lux, she's out there. Hi, Dorian, um, was teaching our workshop. 
and she introduced the idea of an epistolary exchange between poets. And uh, we were intrigued by this idea and were paired up during that workshop. So over the last year, Joy and I started sending each other epistles, um, letters in poetic form and have a collection of about 22. So we're just gonna each read one uh, of those poems for you tonight. Joy. Thank you, Paula. The title of this is Domino Lines, Post to Bruni. Domino artist and YouTuber Lily Hevish set a world record for domino lines using 15,000 524 dominoes that took five days to build and takes over five minutes to collapse. It's not unlike the placing of 2.3 million blocks of limestone and granite in the Great Pyramid of Cheops over a 10 to 20 year period. It's not unlike a series of interconnected epistles between two poets attached at ventricles and cerebella. Neither are afraid to crack open an artery in the heart, let it spill, to take a scalpel and slice the length of a dendrite to view the crystalline mass. They are willing to suffer the consequences, have the patience to watch shattered bones heal, watch gouged flesh regenerate. They are equally as willing to have their eyes widened by riding the opiate trails of extinct birds willing to carry them into unknown pathways. We pretend to etch and engrave our ancient stories into the surface of large blocks, small dominoes, as if they were our own stories, as if they haven't been circling our universe endlessly in eternal recurrence, as if they are fresh and hours alone. Each cycle we learn to say goodbye, prepare ourselves for what returns, what is remade. The fixed and the falling, Bruni to post. Dominoes trail the living room, march the length of tiled hallway, strut to the counter. Charlie, my nephew, who's four, relishes assembly and destruction. Slight as a sparrow, flings himself from chairs, countertops, steep dives from sofa spine, heathen blur on jungle gym. He terrifies me. I've never been good at falling. Bright shame of merthiolate swiped on skin, scabs of indiscretion saved, a war of wounding at every tumble. My body isn't a graceful thing. I'm double jointed, twisting patella, discs loose as juju beads. Stand straight, I was told, as if being vertical, fixed in place might save the fall. But I couldn't be contained, had to push against every terror. Did I tell you I once jumped from a plane at 14,000 feet? Harnessed to an ex-paratrooper who earned his medal in Nam, cradled me as we somersaulted backwards from the hatch, falling away, falling like I've never fallen, falling through the big empty, then stretched out like starfish in the mist, an unbearable float. I was glad for the weight of him pressed against me. I think I might have died otherwise. Cord pulled, we swayed like the point of a pendulum, wide arcs over small habitations of buildings and roads, parks and flowers. The sky climbed inside me, blew me up balloon-like, and still I fell. Some of me scattered before we touched down and my knees buckled. It's adrenaline, he whispered into my ear best drug in the world. He held me after, after the harness no longer strung us together. Do you sense the sky climbing inside you, widening the spaces, pumping your stories with helium, 
pushing them out, your eyes and ears. I'll fill the air between us with words, stories fixed and falling. I won't learn to say goodbye. Mm. Wow. Thank you. So thank you. And Jory, uh, I believe you're going to share one of your other poems that isn't part of our epistolary exchange. That's correct. I think I lead off the next group, but don't you have one you're going to share first? Uh, no, after you, I think. Would be okay. Okay. Um, okay, Ken, thanks so much for putting this together again. It's always a highlight of the year to see this issue of Red Wheelbarrow come out. And thank you for putting together a nice selection of my poems. And I'm going to read one of those called Impermanence. These two young girls in the full bloom of winter vacation, knees scraping concrete sidewalks, use colored chalk the size of bananas to draw intricate designs on their cement canvas. They draw happy faces and cruise ships and castles with moats and golden horses mounted by men and women who dressed in armor. They are too young to know Jimi Hendrix, may never learn of him unless in their 20s or 30s or even 40s become interested in the best guitar players in the world and happen to find the Rolling Stone article about the top 100 and see him at number one atop the list. They may never run across his line, castles made of sand slip into the sea eventually. But it's the line I remember every time I hear his name, every time I hear his fingers dance across guitar strings. When I see two girls drawing with chalk on a sidewalk, a line that has guided my thoughts, functioned as a religion. It's what comes to mind when I see the one girl draw a bridge, the other one add cars. It's all I can think of when I look into the sky above them, see the gnarled gray clouds twisting into themselves, ready to wring out a wet towel. Will they cry or laugh when the thundercloud snaps and the downpour erases their masterpiece, washes it into the gutter, a steady flow through rivulets and creeks and passageways that drop it into the sea to merge with Jimmy's collapsed castles. I stand across the street, hair dripping, watching them inside their house, telling off their heads, noses pressed to the window, watching the sky, a piece of chalk in each of their hands, waiting. Thank you. Thank you. And Caesar, I thought maybe I would go ahead and pass on, on reading another since we're a little behind schedule and I'd let you take sure. the reins from there. How's that? Sure, sure, thank you. And you guys can all feel free to let me know when you're done because I don't always know. <laughs> um, and that helps me know if it's not just a natural pause. Um, anyway, let's keep moving on. Thank you again, um, Paula and Jory. Um, up next, we have um, Ellery Akers, who is the author of three poetry books, most recently Swerve, Environmentalism, Feminism, and Resistance, which won an award from Book Authority as, quote, one of the best environmentalism books of all time. Wow. Now you get a sense of why we interviewed her for this edition of Red Wheelbarrow. Ellery's own also won 13 national writing awards, including the Independent Publisher Book Award and the Poetry, or Poetry International Prize. Also a terrific artist and naturalist, Akers lives in Marin County, but she know, she's no stranger to the South Bay. Welcome Ellery and thank you so much for being here and without the long drive. 
<laughs> thank you, Ken, and thank you, Rob, and thank you, Dorian, for all you do for poetry. And I'm gonna read two short poems from Swerve. And the first one uh, is a poem called Lesions, and it's about the death of starfish along the West Coast. And they have now recovered some, but it's still a really sad thing, lesions. Whenever a species gets stubbed out like this, I feel the border of our lives is fraying. The map of the sea yanked blank in one corner. Sometimes I think we're holding the diameter of the earth in our hands, an elastic band stretched tight and we're living in the years before it snaps back and tosses animals and trees and us away. Maybe we should write a letter to those people of the future. Here is the earth, love it for us. It's hard to believe, but we loved it too. And this next poem is about action. At any moment, there could be a swerve in a different direction. There was a moment when shooting egrets for feathers became wrong. There was a moment when the Wilderness Act changed the lives of billions of blades of grass. I remember the moment when a river that used to catch fire turned from flammable to swimmable. A swerve smells astringent like the wind off the sea. It tastes red the way red hot cinnamon mints burn in your mouth it's heavy the way the weight of letters is heavy, arriving in sacks at the Senate. It sounds like the click of needles as hundreds of thousands of women knit pink hats. It looks like a coyote crossing the freeway to go home. Thank you. Thank you so much, so much, Ellery. Um, our next and final local literary hero, before we turn to our National Poetry Prize winners and finalists, is Gary Young, the author of several collections of poetry. I think his most recent books are, are uh, That's What I Thought, winner of the Lexi Rudnitsky Editor's Choice Award from Persia Books and Precious Mirror Translations from the Japanese. He teaches creative writing and directs the Cowell Press at UC Santa Cruz. And please welcome Gary Young. Thank you. It is always such a thrill to be represented in Red Wheelbarrow. Uh, I'd like to read uh, a poem of mine and I also have several Chinese translations and I'll read one very short one after this poem. Uh, this poem is from a book I'm working on called American Analects, um, obviously taken after uh, the Analects of Confucius. And I have a lot of poems in here about, about people, um, most of whom have died. Uh, believe it or not, I just left one Zoom funeral to come to this. So it's, um, it seems to be in, in the air right now. This poem is, is about uh, a dear, uh, departed friend, Betsy Minter. Betsy Minter woke one morning with a cough and three days later, she was dead. We met when we were children, but it was decades before I learned that from the time she was 11, she and her mother played hearts and drank beer every afternoon while they waited for her father to come home from work. 
60 years ago, her father taught me how to fish. This morning, I fished for hours. I took off my hat when I came in from the water, but for the rest of the day, I couldn't shake the sensation that it was still on my head. And this is, is a brief poem by uh, the Tang Dynasty poet Li Shan. Um, he wrote a number of poems and got in a lot of trouble for it about the plight of farmers and, and the travail of, of peasant farmers in China. It's called Turning the Soil. The soil is turned in the heat of day and sweat drips into the ground. Every grain of rice in your bowl is born out of suffering. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Wow. Mm. Mm. I think uh, it's my turn, isn't it? Or is it your turn, Caesar? I think so, Ken. I think it's your turn. Ken. Okay, it is. Well, <laughs> Gary, uh, that that uh, the readings are so powerful. I just didn't even look at the order, and I, I got lost. <laughs> so uh, thanks, Gary, and and do stay with us a moment because uh, one of the unique aspects of our prize we Thank give here, <clears throat> we're we're turning to this, the next part of our reading now, where we honor the winners of our prize and. Uh, uh, you know, what we do, it's in our, in our fourth year now, and, and one of the best things about it is that we, in addition to cash prizes, we also honor a local fine printer, Gary, this year, and for the third time, Gary, and um, create an original handcrafted broadside. You can see behind my shoulder there <laughs> on a music stand, I put, I put his incredible broadside. Um, so uh, anyway, I don't know if you can still see it, but it's back there. And... Um, uh, so a master poet and printer, Gary has now created three of these broadsides, including this year for A.E. Hines' Faustian Bargain. Um, he used a very cool font. He'll, maybe he'll tell us about it. So we'll screen share an image of the broadside, or at least I'll have it behind me like that. That's probably enough. And, 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 and uh, you can, but you really one day might want to feel the gorgeous paper that it's on to really feel like you're in the same room with it. Um, and I think we can eventually figure out how to order a copy. You can order it through Gary, through me, or through A.E. Hines, who's here. And uh, we, I don't know that we've all priced it yet. It's also new, but just send an email and stay tuned if, if you want to copy yourself. Uh, Gary, can you say a few words about this year's broadside, the process and craft aspect and decisions you had to make, joys or challenges you felt? And, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll read from, we'll, we'll read it. A.E. Hines can read it. Well, whenever I do a broadside, I, I, of course, start with a poem. This is a marvelous poem. I want to thank uh, Dorian and Joe for picking a really marvelous poem with lots of beautiful imagery, which helps. Um, then you're trying to find a, a, an image. And this poem, Faustian Bargain, of course, I, I immediately saw Mephistopheles, or at least a Mephistophelian character. And I went searching, and I found um, a groovy little anonymous 15th century woodcut of a devil. Um, this devil has black wings at the end of the poem. Um, black wings um, surround the, uh, the author and uh, the narrator of the poem. And, uh, and so trying to come up with something uh, that, uh, that would not overwhelm the poem, but would still create a kind of um, medieval uh, frame of mind, uh, because there is a, a, a bargain has been struck in this poem. And as we know, um, those bargains must be paid. So Faustian bargain is, is in a, a text or a black letter font. Um, this was cut by uh, Frederick Gowdy. And the text is a marvelous cutting of Baskerville called Mrs. Eves. So that's pretty much it. The paper is, is uh, uh, Rees BFK, a beautiful mold made sheet made in France. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing this for Gary. <laughs> so 
Um, I think Caesar, you'll introduce the poem. Oh, no, I think we actually, uh, you take it from there and then I believe Dorian will introduce and Joe will introduce the poets. Sure. Okay. Um, thank you for, let me unmute. Am I muted? Chuck. Not muted. Um, thank you very much, Gary. Um, we're there to have our top winners and several finalists here tonight to read their published work. Um, we'd first like, we'd first off like to finish for this prize. You read over 2,500 poems. Uh, that screen groups includes myself, Cynthia White, who will help introduce readers tonight, Stephanie Stein, and Daryl De La Cruz. Um, our final prize judges here were Dorian Lotz, author most recently of the wonderful Only As The Day Is Long, New and Selected Poems, and Joseph Miller, author most recently of the terrific collection Kingdom from Carnegie Mellon University Press. Thank you for such a great job judging and for being there to, here tonight, Dorian and Joe. Um, if you guys would like to say a few words and choose our top two winners, you may do so. Well, I thought I was supposed to actually introduce the top two winners. Yes. Um, who's going to read first? Now, now you, you guys are going to do that now. That'd be great. Okay. Mm -hmm. And who's going to read first? Number one, A.E. Hines. A.E. Hines is going to read first. Okay. And of course, A.E. is the first prize winner and is from Portland, Oregon, which I thought was wonderful. Um, when Joe and I read the first lines of A.E.'s poem, Faustian Bargain, I wanted an open relationship with death. We were hooked. And the poem as a whole really lived up to that promise. I mean, when you have a hook first line like that, it better live up to its promise, and it did. A.E. Hines is a recent Pushcart nominee and his work has appeared in numerous publications, including Atlanta Review, California Quarterly, the Brian Cliff Review, Hawaii Pacific Review, and many others. And he's got a wonderful website you can check out at www.aehines.net. So I welcome A.E. Hines. I'm going to be really excited. We're excited to meet him. Well, thank you so much. I, um, uh, Dorian and Joe, it was such an honor to have you guys select this poem. And um, I was really um, very pleased and obviously about that. Thanks to the Poetry Center and Ken with the Red Wheelbarrow. This is a fantastic event. I'm so happy to be a part of it. And to Gary, Gary, I was blown away by the broadside. I, you know, held back a bunch of them because I wanted to just touch them. Um, they're very tactile and wonderful, and um, hopefully the words live up to the quality of the paper because it's, uh, it's clearly an expensive broadside. Um, but anyway, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Faustian Bargain for Larry Kramer, died May 27th, 2020. I wanted an open relationship with death, an understanding we'd both see other people a promise that at the end of the night, the last party over, we'd still go home together. This one way of explaining how I survived the 80s, the 90s, how I rolled from boy to man, then rolled around with men in that other time of plague. Walked over flame-kissed stones without so much as a blister. For years, though, I worry time's running out. Catch glimpses of him stalking from corners of dark bars. Too often, find we're in love with the same person. Awkward triangles that never last. Games of lust, he always wins. I stay. Watch so many go. But I'm no immortal. One night, bartered time expired, having done with it whatever I've managed to do. He'll stroll up and tap my shoulder. Tell me, a deal's a deal. Only then, enveloped in his black and terrible wings, when he chokes me with his kisses, will I understand the worth of time and what I've paid. My only hope, that he comes first for me, and not my husband, that angel of a man. I hope he's upstairs asleep, 
or out running an errand. Maybe someplace down the block, lost, searching for our car. Thank you. Wow. Thanks. So our second reader tonight who won second prize um, for the contest was Arian Reed. Is that correct, Arian? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Yeah, I did it right. Yeah. You did. Um, Arian Reed, who describes himself as a Baha'i, differently abled, queer, trans man who holds an MFA from National University, lives with his husband and works at Fresno City College, where he co-founded the LGBTQ Allied Staff and Faculty Association, on which he currently serves as president. President, a good president of a good <laughs> place. His poetry and art have been published widely. We can't wait to read how he reads his Cleve poem, Requiem for a Scream. Welcome and congratulations, Arian. Thank you so much, Dorian. My name is Arian Reed. My pronouns are he, him, his, and it's been an honor to be a part of uh, Red Bull Barrel and to be second place. Uh, it's been truly an honor. So I'm going to start reading my Requiem for a Scream Cleave poem. Uh, I'm going to read it across and then I'll read it down. I could have told you this is how it begins. I could have shown you how a little girl hides inside and a man stares out from my eyes. They hold hands delicately. I'm not sure where I began. The girl also cringes in my skeleton. I tell them to be quiet, but maybe it was a song. Maybe I was always trans. Maybe I was never here. My every breath is a requiem. My every thought is a disappear. Yet I want to be alive, a cord churning into fire, snapping, flashing, vibrant, and loud as birth. That cacophony of rhythm I never wanted to hear. Take me there, but let me live, fresh as flesh still tearing. My voice shreds my own ears. I don't recall a single moment where I loved my sounds, so I broke them like fingers. I wasn't ready to call my own. Now I'm going to read the poem uh, going down. I could have told you a little girl hides inside, and I'm not sure where I began. Maybe it was a song. My every breath is a requiem a cord churning into fire, that cacophony of rhythm, fresh as flesh still tearing, where I loved my sounds. This is how it begins. A man stares out from my eyes. The girl still cringes in my skeleton. Maybe I was always trans. My every thought is a disappear, snapping, flashing, vibrant. I never wanted to hear. My voice shreds my own ears. So I broke them like fingers. I could have shown you how they hold hands delicately. I tell them to be quiet, but maybe I was never here. Yet I want to be alive and loud as birth. Take me there, but let me live. I don't recall a single moment. I wasn't ready to call my own. Thank you. I just put the poem so you could see again, because it's special to see that, that double cleave. So, um, well, so uh, I think we're supposed to move on, but thank you to Arian and also to, uh, Dorian and Joe for your work and then your being here. It really honors us and it's really fun to have you here. And and Arian, that poem is sensational. And the mm -hmm. prize winners, um, I hope you just write poetry for a long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> I plan on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I think it's my turn now to speak. Um, uh, thank you again, Ari and um, AE, or Ernest, I think he said or your name was. Um, unfortunately, our third prize winner, Jim Daniels um, from Pittsburgh, could not be here tonight to read his poem, looking. Um, but now, um, my fellow screener, Cindy White, and I will introduce the finalists to read. Um, and really grateful to have several of these attendants, several, several of these people in attendance tonight. Um, up first will be uh, Claire Acerno, who is a mother, grandmother, housefrau, poet, and all around fun gal. She says, your mind is your best friend. Tell it what you want, make it happy, and pass it around. <laughs> uh, we look forward to hearing her read her poem, The Visit slash Alzheimer's. Welcome, Claire. Thank you. Thanks, guys. It's great to be here. I appreciate it. This poem was for my mom, who passed away March 24th of COVID. The visit, Alzheimer's. The sky with its empty space. That is not the poem. Not the bird at our feet, hop pups on two stick legs. Nor the tree's summer branches with its last green leaves ready to fall. That is not the poem. We watch rays of sunlight dance on the channel, brush to become one with the Atlantic. That is not the poem. Hours repeat the scene. Mother sits beside me. Her one break wheelchair rolls yesterday into today, tomorrow. Not one decision left to make. Her foot flicks in time to music. Only she can hear. That is not the poem. The cloud white blue circle of her eye blinks. I'm going to miss it here. What will you miss, Mom? I wonder. I'll miss you, her simple reply. I'll miss you too, Mom. That is the poem. Thanks. I think it's my turn to introduce the next um, poet, who is David Ackerman, who I assume is here somewhere. I am here. Wonderful. I'm going to introduce you. It's great to be here with you all. And that was lovely, Claire. Thank you so much. Stephen Ackerman worked as an attorney in the legal counsel division of the New York City Law Department for over 30 years. He retired in 2019. His poems have appeared in many publications. If I Had As Many Hands As Vishnu is from his current manuscript, Late Life. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to have a poem uh, appearing in Red Wheelbarrow. And thanks to uh, all involved uh, in putting together this reading and, and the magazine. Um, so, if I had as many hands as Vishnu, I would touch you tenderly and then touch myself tenderly as I wished to be touched by you. I would open four books and read four passages with my four tongues. And these choristers would be Shahrazad for the four queens of you. If I had as many hands as Vishnu, I would draw silk with one hand from my sleeves, blindfold you with silk with another, lash you with silk with another, remove the blindfold with another. I would text you with a free hand and telephone you with an idle hand to report that I had applied WD-40 to the valves with one hand, removed the souffle from the oven with another, scattered the seed for the songbirds across the surface of the earth with another, leashed the dogs with another, and was now in the field playing long toss as I washed your hair with another. There would always be one hand soothing you with the vowels of a sign language that I perfected by listening to the sounds, the signs made in you. And I would release the fingers of my leftmost hand to do as they please, while my rightmost hand conducted the string section and the brass and the wind 
the west wind, which traveled down the lifeline of one of my many hands. I could not foretell how long I would live for all my hands told a different story. And I could not foretell how long we would love though all my hands sought to please you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, up next, we have Bridget Bell, who is an English instructor at Durham Technical Community College and a proofreader for Four Way Books, an independent mass, independent press in Manhattan. Her work has appeared widely in national literary journals. Bridget is currently working in the poetry collection about perinatal mood disorders. Welcome in, Bridget. Thank you. Um, so this is a short little poem um, from a collection that I'm working on that is about perinatal mood disorders and maternal mental health. Um, and it's just kind of a list poem packed full of, of metaphors and it's called Postpartum Depression. A strange fish in the ocean's midnight zone, unable to ever see light, a hot, empty attic, a loose button dropping unnoticed off the cuff, slick stones at the bottom of a river, a car shattered deer dragging its broken body, a window painted shut, a cornered mouse frantic along the floorboards, wheels on black ice spinning, spinning, spinning. Thank you. Mm. That was very powerful. Thank you. Our next reader is Chelsea Bunn. Chelsea Bunn is the author of the chapbook Forgiveness from Finishing Line Press 2019 and a recipient of the Rita Dove Award for Poetry. Her work appears in Best New Poets, Maudlin House, and many others. Chelsea currently lives and teaches in New Mexico. We look forward to hearing her read Planned Parenthood Abecedarium. Welcome, Chelsea. Hi, thank you. Hi, what's up everyone? My name is Chelsea Bunn. Uh, for accessibility, I just am going to share a Google Doc of my poem for anyone who might want to see it. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Really quickly, just want to say congratulations to the winners of the Red Wheelbarrow Prize and all the other finalists and semi-finalists. Uh, this poem is called Planned Parenthood, Abyssidarian. Almost Thanksgiving, when I hold the plastic stick blotted with a little plus sign in my hand, faint calligraphy made by waste, desire turned to matter. Minutes turn elastic. I imagine you here. I imagine you not here. From above, you'd see a woman, her man, glimmer of what if between them. Days later, I haunt the waiting room, pale infidel, braced to be divested of an unnamed jewel. The young technician asks, do I want to know if there is more than one? And would I like to see the image on the screen? After my soft no, I scan her face for information, find none. What do I expect? A cheerful, it's smaller than an olive. And would I like her to insert the wand? It will be painless. She studies the womb quarry from which you will be blasted and raked clean through me. I am blank as a slab of pure white stone. I tie my shoes. And because it feels unholy not to, Left alone, I stand in view of the monitor. I see a mouse or a duckling floating weightless through a gray galaxy. I see through myself. A plus tipped over is an X, a value not yet known. 
on the edge of this new year, bittersweet sacrament offers itself to me again and again. Zygote, sweet pea, primitive streak, bulge that holds the basic heart. Thank you, Red Wheelbarrow, and thank you, everybody. Can we, can we share that screen really fast? I know you put a Google Doc in, but would it be okay? There might be people here who don't know what, what an ABC dairy, and could you just describe what it is really quickly? You can see the, the left edge, right? Mm -hmm. So it just uses all of the letters of the alphabet in order to begin each line. And it, it's, it's, it just makes the poem even more powerful to read it through that way. And I, I thought there might be some people who've never seen that before. So, thank you. All right. Um, I think I'm now. Um, I know Imani, I was speaking to you earlier. Are you still here? Imani Suzanne? Just let me know if you are so I can introduce you. Did she have to leave, uh, Caesar? I'm not sure. I was talking to her earlier and trying to make sure she was still on, but I'm not seeing her in the private thing. So I'm assuming that's a, that's a no. But we could come back to Imani if she returns. Yes, yes, yes. Um, in that case, Cindy, do you want to continue on? It's my pleasure to introduce Susan Florence. Uh, Susan Florence's career has been writing and illustrating gift products and gift books for many years, but it is the creative process of poetry that keeps her profoundly connected to herself, finding ground, especially during these uncertain and difficult times. She will read her poem, Legacy. Welcome, Susan. Is Susan here? I hope so. <laughs> Uh-oh. We have somebody else, AWOL, no? Hmm. Oh no, there's someone there. There is? Unmute, unmute. Unmute. Okay, good. Did it work? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, and everyone at Red Wheel Barrel. You know, all these poems are amazing and I can't wait to receive the collection. Um, thank you, everyone. I, I wrote this poem after I, I listened to an interview um, at, in, on NPR last, I think it was in March or the 1st of April, about this um, Navajo Valentina Black Horse who had died of COVID and left her 18 month old daughter named Poet. And I just felt like I needed to share about this woman. Legacy, in memoriam of Valentina Blackhorse, 28, died of coronavirus, April 23rd, 2020. For my daughter, poet, I wash sleep from your eyes with cloth woven of the Milky Way. Gently, these starlit threads in sky's night will open you today. I feed you words of our unwritten language that voices of the elders will nurture you. Their stories sown in you, shared and spread like wild morning glory on desert floor. I clothe you in my jingled dress to sparkle and dance at one with rattle, flute, whistle, and drum in prayer and ceremony and song. You will spring tall as fertile fields of corn and the spirit of Sister Turtle will enable you to walk a long life on sacred soil. Plumes of Brother Eagle will crown your hair. Your family of all living things will guide you and your homeland of plains, mountains, forests, and lakes will be your ground. They say I left too soon, a beauty, someone who cared about our culture, 
a woman with dreams of leading the Navajo nation, but the dream I dreamed was you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, up next, we have Ben Gunsberg, who is an associate professor of English at Utah State University. He is the author of the poetry collection, Welcome Dangerous Life, and the chapbook Rhapsodies with Portraits. He lives in Logan, Utah, at the foot of the Bear River Mountains. Give it up for Ben Gunsberg. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm so honored to be here. Thanks to Ken and everyone who helped put together this event. Um, it's comforting to know that, you know, other people are, are, are writing and um, it's a real, it's a blessing to be here. So I'm going to read my poem, uh, Winter 2020, A Premonition. Months ago, I mourned the death of my guitar. Glitter washed off the treble, bass emptied of dark rum. Dry heat split the spruce, Eleuther said. Happens this time of year. She snapped, we think, or he's cracked. How many hard strummed hours? Had I loosened strings? What difference does it make? Without tension, nothing rings. Waves ceased, chords went slack. My mind unraveled and then the fog filled with sirens. The wish to drift near rocks. I saw myself die slowly in a small wooden box where rhythms coughed and scales panicked. Before the top recessed, before the breach, I played for hours, slid between high and low E, notes strolling downhill, notes rising like herons. I sang until my lungs ached, until the scalloped brace jerked. A shudder passed between the sound hole and my chest. My ears searched for some constant other than sirens. They swell now, one shrill note. Thank you. That's amazing, thank you so much. Um, I am supposed to find out if Heidi Richardson is here. Is Heidi here tonight with us? If Heidi's not here, um, it's because uh, she's been dealing with the COVID crisis close to home, actually at home. And so she might not be able to join us. So we send her our best wishes. So I think Caesar, that's it. Is that it for the finalists? I believe so, yes. And I think now it is time for Rose Black to do a little talk on um, yes. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. You can. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Um, are we ready? Okay. Well, tonight, um, Lisa Sharnock and I would like to honor two of the four inmates whose work is published in this red wheelbarrow. And their names are uh, Ubaldo Teke Jr. and Larry D. Jones. And we're so happy to be here tonight to honor these men and their work. Um, Salinas Valley State Prison is five miles north of the city of Soledad um, in Monterey County, uh, California, and it houses approximately 3,700 men. The uh, writing workshop program was started in 2012 by um, poet Ellen Bass and um, prison psychologist, Dr. Benjamin Block. And um, in, in Dr. Block's words in uh, 2015, uh, he, he said the workshop's purpose is to offer participants an opportunity to embrace creativity as a way to actively transform their experience and to become makers and creators. Our current workshop teachers are myself, uh, Rose Black, Lisa Sharnock, um, Ken Weisner, and Julie Murphy. And all of us um, 
also helped to initiate Right to Write Press, which is a newly formed uh, California nonprofit. And it promotes the growth of emerging writers incarcerated in California state prisons. And you can explore that, uh, the press further at righttowritepress.org. So um, I'm going to start off with um, two of uh, Ubaldo Teque Jr.'s poems. Uh, he's originally from Guatemala and he crossed the river into Southern California, piggyback on a stranger's back when he was five years old. So years later at the prison, he wrote about this experience and he wrote about his life before and after. Um, in October of this year, 2020, uh, his uh, first collection of poems, Nino in Magrante, uh, was published by Right to Write Press. And that is now um, on Amazon, you can find it there. And uh, so in this book, he journeys back to the ancient Mayan landscape in which he was rooted. Oops, there it is. And, um, and, and then he reaches towards sky. It's just amazing what he does here. So the first uh, poem of his I'll read is uh, called uh, Some Advice to Those Who Will Serve Time in Prison. And it's written after uh, the poet uh, Nazem Hikmik. And uh, this is what uh, uh, Ubaldo Teke says. As that big metal door shuts behind you, don't show your fear. Breathe normal and don't you dare sweat. Shut your mouth. Observe all your surroundings. This is now home. Your eyes won't deceive you. Who do you run with, they will ask. Think, really think what your response will be because they will use you. Sleep with one eye open and don't become a creature of habit. These two will save your life. Don't accept gifts from anyone. There are no free rides inside of this bitch. On days that you won't feel human, take a cold shower. You will come back to life. The wife, the girlfriend, they will leave. But believe me, in due time, another white dove will bring you love. Always mind your business. Always keep yourself busy. Work, draw, pray, exercise, attend self-help groups, enroll in school or college, try something new. Life grows, goes on. If one day you want to die because the inside world has beat you, reach out for your pencil, write what you feel on those cell walls. Every word will take away a little bit of the pain and bring you moral strength inside of the beast. And the um, next poem I want to read by um, Ubaldo Teke is called January, February Prayer. I find it so hard to write about January and February. A chilly feeling emerges from my sleeves, having to reminisce about the two decades of strong winds that blew my children away like fallen leaves. I lost their tiny voices in the long stretch in between highways, hills, and deserts. Time moved on without me. My essence vanished from their sides. Stranded on lockdown, I fought off stress by reaching out to photos and old memories so that I could hold my composure inside of this cold, dark world never sure if there was food, clothes, shoes, toys, or roof over their small heads, or who was putting them to bed, especially in January and February. Every day I dread 
as I tie my shoestrings at dawn. Prison is a dangerous place. False reports and spoken lies by the LAPD have ended their lifespan. O oh, Creator, protect my girls, son, and grandchildren as we hold hands walking towards the truth. I'm an innocent man. Thank you. And now it's Lisa's turn. Lisa Sharnock. Thank you, Rose. And I, I want to thank Ken and Rose for all the work that they've put in year over year, um, bringing these poems forward in the Red Wheelbarrow. Mr. Larry D. Jones has been a member of the Salinas Valley State Prison Workshop for many years. And he has a novel that is in prose and poetry called Reality of a Spiritual Kind, which has been published handwritten um, by the Prison Foundation and is available at prisonsfoundation.org. Mr. Jones's recent writing addresses civil rights, issues highlighted by the Black Lives Matter movement and COVID-19. He's deeply religious, uh, political from a life full of experience rooted in cotton fields and family. Jones's poems ring out, they sing out, and they leave the reader wondering, how the hell did he do that? I'm going to read two pieces. Um, the first is a song in haiku form. So it's multiple haikus and it's called Jones of Jones. Close to you again, when the night is running out, the sun runs in. I see portals that reveal a hung down head silently knocking. Sleep glued eyes gather, protect a song I didn't know I sang. Too high to move, I'm waking up dead, see stones counting my days. Walking talons of time, authentic, Pentagon line, catch before complete. Turn over wind and slap the air, pebbles much closer to being all there. The core of distance, repetition, protection, my gravitation. Jones of Jones, cornerstone, not for distance, just special kinship. I could talk to you all day, but that would put my heart back in the way. Boundaries were made when the night is running out, the sun runs in. The next piece by Mr. Jones is in the form of a high bun, which is a prose poem that's followed by a haiku. And it's called Last Ride, John Lewis, Good Trouble in Alabama 2020. It's undercurrent churning for the days that have gone by, way back to the day of March 7th, 1965. No more, it's 2020 now. The life of John Lewis rests in the treetops that watch over that Alabama river that holds to this earth as John's soul went to meet his maker. John Lewis and the marchers tried to breach the stronghold of the KKK that day on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, March 7th left them bloody and bruised, resulted in the given name, Bloody Sunday. The troops set the stage of action for the future and the bridge, the stainless steel teeth that showed through the view on the TV screen. They set like a hat, snapshots of the racist past and present, looking back at him through the teeth of that bridge, calling John Lewis's name as the river moves on to its destination. Every so often the clopping hooves of the horse driven wagon would stop over the hill, over the still water of the Alabama River's face, flat as a spatula on top. That was the starting line. John Lewis helped so many people get out of the starting blocks of life. His blunt force trauma to the head and body couldn't stop John Lewis's soul. His time was for all time, meet you on higher ground. He was in people's eyes and bodies, even on Bloody Sunday. Go have some more good trouble. Solid, stone, fluent, as moving water never stopped 
John Lewis, love. Thank you. I think that is me again. Caesar, you're having a little trouble with the uh, connection, I think. Can you hear us? Maybe, Rob, should Can I go ahead? Can you hear me? Can I fill in for this, Rob? Am I on? My internet might be phasing out. Yeah, you might want to take over, Ken, for... You, you sound good, but your your image is frozen. Oh, there you are. Yeah, I think it's just my... You want yeah, to take over. You want to log in again or something? You take it. Okay, well... No, it's just my internet. Well, you sound good so you now. you might have to take over. You sound good now. <laughs> it's coming in and out. You might take over. Okay. Um, so... I also wanted to just mention to, to thank the prize winners and finalists from before um, to have heard each of you and, and how much we appreciate you. And then I feel the same way about, and I know Caesar does too, about Rose and Lisa and uh, the poets in Salinas Valley State Prison. Those are interesting voices and we're determined to, to include them in our community um, for all the implications that ends up having. Um, hopefully more connection and more thinking about their lives. Um, and thanks Lisa for joining me and Rose. Um, so uh, we have just two more riffs yet left for the reading. Um, we're really happy it's huge. And I just wanted to let you know where we are. Um, so we have just two riffs left really. We have a, uh, a poetry riff to close the reading at the end from local kind of Santa Cruz area poets, San Jose poets. And then we have a, uh, a, a flash fiction kind of um, and prose um, riff also. But before that, at this point, I was gonna do a slideshow of some of the art in the, um, uh, in the anthology. So I'll just go ahead and do that um, and Maybe Caesar can get his internet back or something. So I will share a screen. And I wanna know if some of these artists are here is, um, uh, let me start with, uh, this, I wanna show the um, actual anthology to you and get the right. So here we go. So, um, this is kind of a, an art break for us to have. And um, uh, this is kind of, and by the way, you can go to the Red Wheelbarrow website at De Anza and download the PDF. We're at least keeping it open for that now. So anybody who's here can do that and can at your leisure look at it online if you download it to your computer. Um, so this is now, now as of today available to you as well. Um, but I'll, I'll just do this little slideshow here. And uh, let me just check before I start to see which artists are in attendance. Um, is is uh, Kevin Cooley here? Uh, can you tell Rob if Kevin's here? Kevin and Noah do not seem to be in attendance, but we do have Mark Harris. And I'm also here, Dorothy Atkins. So Mark and Dorothy are here? Yes. But not, not Hank or, or Kevin or Noah. Okay, so when we get to uh, their stuff, can I slow down, Dorothy and and Mark, and you guys can talk a little bit about your art. Maybe sure. you you could open up their mics, Rob. You bet. Okay. Well, so one thing is just to start at the beginning. Then the uh, the cover looks like this. Most of you know that. It's um, uh, the two people whose images are on the cover here are not with us. Can Ken, yeah. we're just seeing a black screen at the moment. Oh, you are? Okay. Uh, then let me start that share over again. Thank you for telling me that. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me start the share again. So you can see this now. <laughs> <laughs> 
There it is. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, sorry, and thanks for. I really appreciate you alerted me to that because I can't tell. So anyway, just just to, you know, this is all on the website too. And, and when you receive your book, you'll have a beautiful uh, book to hold. I tell you, it's really special in that way this year. So um, the uh, the front cover is Kevin Cooley's uh, photograph, and he was going to be here. And it you'll see uh, it's slightly cropped, and it's called Latuna Canyon Fire, and and he, his life changed during that fire. I think his his life was implicated in it. And so and that was in, I think, 2017 or 18. And the, he and he and Noah Berger are, uh, they're uh, kind of newspaper photographers, but also Kevin is very self-identified as an artist. I wish he was here. And we have an intro to his stuff where he talks about his art. And then the guy on the back cover there is a, he was, Pulitzer Prize nominated journalistic photographer who's been following the fires around for um, the last few years and just has incredible images and thoughts about it. Um, so, but to just have the fires seemed really wrong, right? This, this whole book this year felt different to all of us, I think. Like we were saying, well, we need stuff about the pandemic and we need to think about the fires. We have to think about Black Lives Matter. Um, we have to think about uh, politics. So we've just been um, trying to include more art. We also want it to be uplifted by some art. So we just have more because the, the intense times seem to squeeze more art into the into the magazine, which made it more expensive, but also really fun this year. So that's the cover. Um, this is a oh, this one. the The back cover is is from the Delta Fire, two thousand eighteen, by Noah Berger. So if I go like this now, can you still can you still see the, the screen, uh, Joe? Or do I have to start the, the share? Over? Yeah, we're all good. All good. Okay. So what, what you're looking at here is our frontispiece, and I'm going to kind of do a little, uh, uh, just to kind of go through, uh, um, kind of as a slideshow type of thing. So uh, let me do that. So this is Hank Willis Thomas's work, and he's. A, a renowned uh, uh, artist whose work is at the San Jose Museum of Art. And uh, he does sculpture, he does mixed media. And there's a whole section of the book coming up where I'll pause and just tell you what that is. But these are his sculptures, uh, Raise Up on the right, The Lives of Others. And just to let you know, um, he, he, uh, he was interested in being in the magazine because of the work we do with inmates. Um, and he's uh, himself very uh, socially identified. And uh, we'll, we'll get to a folio of his work in a minute. You can see how Kevin Cooley here um, has, has these images that are much more uh, abstract about the experience of fire. And we were very moved by these. Um, these are two more realistic images, the cover photo and another from Lone Pine Fire. Um, is it okay to kind of scroll them like this at that speed? Then we can move on to more poetry. <laughs> this is a, 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 a piece of his, of Kevin Cooley's that was in the New Yorker um, at, at some point, but we wanted to reprint it. It's um, uh, um, from uh, Woolsey Fire and uh, it's spread across two pages. Um, and then, so he does realistic as well as these uh, very abstract pa uh, paintings and projects like this one. Mm -hmm. Create explosion. This is called Starlight Explosion. Very abstract in three panels. And then uh, he does these kind of um, uh, smoke um, types of uh, images. Uh, that one's called, these are called controlled burns. And we have three of them in there. Uh, the, the colors and on the nice paper in the book are really terrific. Um, and I thought Kevin was going to be here. He's not here. He's not just shy in the background somewhere. But too bad. Um, so yeah, we have his controlled burns, his realistic stuff, his stuff on the cover. That's where one of Steve's poems is next to his controlled burn. Just to keep the facing pages correct, there's a... So then with Hank Willis Thomas, um, who's world-renowned artist, um, is very very much identifies with um oh, i'm supposed to be stopping this here 
he, he very much self-identifies as a an artist of uh, identity uh, African American identity. We've written about him. I'll let you explore it yourself on the CD, but I mean on the PDF. And you can see here that he's interested in uh, it's very clean sculptural idea about irony and about in your face, you know, conceptual. He's a conceptual artist. And we should really have an art person here, not me, talking about this. But that's called And One. So he's interested in so many things. We tried to give you a mix. And I think this one might be at the San Jose Museum now. I'm not sure. Um, you know, it, it, it's called Raise Up. Uh, that's it's bronze, uh, bronze sculpture. This is another one of his uh, sports photographs, you know, with the chain there uh, called Football and Chain. Um, and then, he, and then he, we have some of his quilts. So what he did was he create. oh, no, first we have the, um, uh, this, uh, this bronze sculpture here with the barbed wire. And these are just magnificent across two pages, but if the leader only knew, uh, kind of these attempts to escape where we are, but also the showing the tortured, torturous boundaries we live under and within. Then we have four of these um, quilts made out of decommissioned prison uniforms. So he, he did a whole series of quilts. This one on the right is called We the People. You can really even see the words We the People in there. And the one on the left uh, is also a decommissioned prison uniforms. Um, so he's excited to read and uh, be involved in the, and, and his, his presentation of art comes right before the poetry that Rose and Lisa just read for you. Angola bound um, quilt made out of decommissioned prison uniforms. Um, you know, many of our men work in the kitchen and such. This is called Meshers. That one's called Life. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, an image called uh, Absolute. It looks like a bottle of uh, Absolute No Return, a bottle of Absolute Vodka. It looks very much like a, uh, you know, one of those places where uh, people may have been sent out on ships to, uh, to a life of slavery. Um, but turned into sort of a, a hallucinated vodka bottle there. A lot of irony, a lot of clean ideas. And then uh, Mark Harris is here because Mark is very, also is very much a brilliant San Francisco artist who um, is working and uh, doing these collage mixed media pieces. And he's here. Mark, do you want to tell us about your work as I scroll through it? Yeah, um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I'm just kind of overwhelmed by the by the Hank Willis Thomas work, which some of those pieces I've seen in person, and they still, um, you know, they still strike me every time I see them. Um, uh, and so I, my my work is 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 in the same vein, um, where I'm attempting to use, uh, you know, reappropriated imagery uh, from Americana, and juxtapose it. Um, with text and, um, and, you know, really simplified messaging. Um, I was really uh, interested in, inve in investigating the advertisement from uh, sort of the golden age of America post-war uh, between, you know, 1950 to the late 60s and Life magazine. And uh, just really taking a lot of those archetypes and images and turning them on their head um, to to create an alternative narrative to what you know what we're fed um, you know continuously that that becomes unconscious in how it impacts our belief beliefs and how we see others um, and so these are just a few examples of of some of my work um, that I was really um, fortunate and grateful uh, that it made it into this year's um, this year's book so. Um, yeah, you know, I, I really admire um, the ability to take, you know, the written word and paint a mental picture. And, and, and so what I try to do is, um, you know, create a visual sort of poem so that when you're looking at my work, that hopefully it's creating a story in your head um, about, you know, a lot of the issues that, that are, we're facing in terms of um, specifically police violence against uh, African-Americans 
Um, but I've also, you know, tackled immigration and gun violence and, and other things of that nature. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of people who would love to, it's like every five minutes you want to stop, ask questions, say hi, <laughs> get to know more. But, and by the way, Dorothy's images start here only because I've created a file that only has the art in it. But Dorothy's image is not actually right across from the image but some of our more political poetry is. And um, it's just, I, I just, you know, I think everyone, me included, will love your, your, uh, your art when they see it um, in the magazine and can sit with it a little longer. Um, and you're in San Francisco, right? Yes. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm actually in my studio right now. So it's a little cold, which is why I have the hat on. <laughs> Want to show us one thing you're working on there? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I actually don't have anything in in a in a in a in an advanced state, unfortunately. Um, or otherwise, I would. But it's just kind of background paintings right now. Nothing nothing within the imagery yet. You also do mural work, don't you? Yes. Yeah, I've done a lot of mural work this uh, since the end of April this year, and um, I potentially have another project uh, before the end of this year. Um, a commission for a, resi a residential um, space here in the city. Um, and then I've already got a, a couple of projects lined up for next year with um, uh, middle school age uh, youth. Wonderful. Well, I think we also appreciate you being here and just coming by to talk to us. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. I so much. And, and I know you wanted two, one for you and one for your mother, right? Right. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. They're coming. And Dorothy, you're here too, right? Yes, I'm here. So, you know, your art uh, made us all just, what's the, what's the series is called the One Love series, One Love Paintings, right? Right. And I think that's why we included, we're so happy to, to include them. We all need one love this year. So you want to talk a little bit about the series and about yourself as an artist? I know you're a San Jose artist, just sitting right there in San Jose. How many of us already know about you? We should all know about you. I'm, I'm in San Jose, but I also want to say to Mark, I'm from San Francisco too, by way of Vallejo, California. And my family still lives in San Francisco and I love your work. My, my painting started from a place of, it was about the time of George Floyd. And I remember how exhausted I was to be a woman of color in America. And um, my background is that the narrative was always different than what I saw in my family and what I saw with my children. It wasn't what was being portrayed out in the media. I mean, I came from a very loving, strong family and it was important for me when I was talking to my <clears throat> friends that were not of color, they were trying to figure out why black lives mattered. Uh, it, it just seemed so uh, foreign to them, or and, and some of them even went as far as to say, you guys whine too much, get over it. And uh, it was really important for me to try to find the place in art where I could show that we all have the same wants and desires and needs in this world. We all want love, uh, a safe place for our family, an education, safety, and I had to put it in the context of showing the love of our race as well. And not so much in the political active part, but I wanted people to feel that this is what we all are about too, that we have so much in common that you have to look at it and find that place that shows all lives matter and Black Lives Matter too. And so my point in doing this, it changed the way I painted. And I wanted you to have that feeling of the commonalities that we share as a people and see it in my artwork. And that's what I was trying to do and how I painted. And my art had changed so much since being locked in and sequestered. And I wanted to change the narrative about we are so human and so kind as a people and so caring. And I wanted that part of us to be shown in my work. 
And so I started doing this one love series that just sort of capulated everything that I was feeling while locked up at home. And so that's what I was trying to get across to the viewer, that it's one love. We're all human beings, we're one love. And so I started my paintings with this. And you, you also write poetry. I do write poetry. I mean, I write, I paint, I write, I paint. And um, I do both. I've always done both. And so I was trying to show that. And um, I think I, I did in a way that it makes you think of us as humans rather than someone to be chased down and murdered. Well, all of us as humans. Well, that, that context is really beautiful to hear. And uh, your art is wonderful discovery. And I, again, I think people will really enjoy having the, and this is not a sales pitch here. I'm saying that you will really enjoy, of course it could be half a sales pitch, but you could really enjoy seeing the beautiful, you know, six by nine size images in on, thank on, you. on lovely paper. And it's a, it's a wonderful folio. And thank so you. thank you so much for sharing and for being here, Dorothy. Yeah, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Ken. Send us poems next year. Thank you. <laughs> and then with, with Noah Berger, Berger just, to, just to end it, you can see there, uh, he, he's the last artist, you can see the, the image, you know, wear a mask, wash your hands, social distance, stay, stay safe. And does that, does that have the 2020 written in it right there? It's a senior center uh, in the... Uh, local fire here, the complex fire um, in 2020. Wear a mask, wash your hands, social distance, stay safe. Um, so, so in some ways, I think we were just trying to, to have the, the book, the 2020 book be something you could pull off the shelf and say, yeah, that was 2020. That was, that was what happened that year. A lot of years you don't think about your year as a special thing, but this year I think we all do. Um, yeah, but, so these are just incredible, uh, he's an incredible news photographer. So, you know, you can just see California, very artistic Pulitzer Prize nominee. This, this one is called Flames Consume Shasta Historic Schoolhouse. Uh, on the right, Flames Crest Hilltop above Cash Creek Casino. <laughs> just like, these are images of California. And then, you know, ending the whole book, really, this ends the book with a human message. Inmate firefighter. River Fire, 2020. Uh, so many inmates are out there fighting fires for, for no money, for a couple bucks an hour. And, you know, they, um, they're just often exhausted. This one is called Inmate Firefighters at Rest. And as you all know, you know, if they just, as soon as they can, they just lie down in the road to sleep for an hour. And it's, it's a beautiful photograph. Um, and then finally, he also goes, he's sent out by the newspaper also, to, and he's a, I believe he's a San Francisco guy, but he was sent out to Portland to cover the demonstrations. And it, it, it just struck us so much how similar the sort of feeling of his Portland protest foot photography is to, to his fire photography. It's like, yeah, we're on fire. So uh, federal officers disperse protesters, Portland 2020 on the left. Look at the color and the strangeness of that awful. A federal invasion. And then feds go home, Portland, the demonstrations that, and the light and the, uh, the human light coming back out of there. And then finally, the last page of the book, except for the bio notes, is um, Wall of Moms, Portland 2020. <laughs> it's one of those walls of moms. And uh, so there's a little, that's the last image there in the, of this folio. So that's the art for. For the for the magazine this year, and I, I think is Caesar back. I mean, wouldn't it be nice to just have a discussion with our artists and keep talking about art? But no, we have a little more reading to go, and we're supposed to be done by nine o'clock. So that, let's keep going. I think, Rob, don't you think? And and some patient readers here. So sure. is, is Caesar back to the MC? No, I don't think Caesar is back. But uh... you can try to find him and get him back. I I don't know what happened to him. So, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, you, you two, for being with us. Um, so, 
uh, and you know, I hope we can stay connected over time, Mark and Dave. So, uh, it, just to check is um, uh, the la the readers of short prose would be Vikram, Kim, Linda, Carol, and Suzanne. Is Vikram here? Yeah. Yes, okay. he is. How about Kim? Kim Hecko. And Helene too. And Helene, but it, what about Kim Hecko? I'm here. And how about Linda Lappin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Carol Park. Yep. Okay, great. So then we have a full house. So it'll be. Vikram, then Kim, Linda, then Helene, and then Carol and Suzanne. And uh, they're gonna read a few minutes just to give you a taste of their prose. So Vikram Ramakrishnan is, is up late tonight. It's after 11 back where he is. He's, but I put him with the prose. So he's a Tamil American writer and computer programmer and alumnus of Uni University of Pennsylvania where he studied physics, math, and computer science, but also a graduate of the Odyssey Writing Workshop where he won the Walter and Katie Metcalf Singing Spider Scholarship. So he lives in New York and welcome to Vikram. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Ken. Um, I'm super excited to be here, honored to be in Red Wheelbarrow. Uh, it's been inspiring to see and listen to everyone's art today. I thought I would read from my flash. It's titled, uh, it's in the issue, A Crack in the Ground That Went to the Other Side of the Earth. Uh, when I wrote it, I had been thinking a lot, when I wrote it at the time, I'd been thinking a lot about family and kind of particularly the unique relationships of fathers and sons. So I'll read it here. One time Appa said, the planet broke in half, and I looked down at the jagged line in the dirt he was pointing at, and I agreed. Yeah, that's a crack, but you think that goes all the way to the other side? He nodded in a sage way and poked at it with a stick before he got on his knees and stuck a coin in there, but it wouldn't go in. A month later, the coin did go in, on my birthday a pencil, and on New Year's, he'd wedged a carom striker before he shook his head real slow. Not good, he said. He would come to check on the fracture a few times every day, and I started thinking this was the only thing that made him happy since Amma disappeared. He made us look for knickknacks and trinkets that we could edge into the crack, and when I asked him if we were making it bigger, he barked at me and said, no, it's happening on its own. When it was wide enough to fit a parlay G biscuit face down, we lit a few firecrackers in and dropped them in and laughed when they popped. Appa didn't yell or anything, but instead, he packed up his bags, threw on a jacket he hadn't worn in years, tied his dhoti around his ankles, and headed to the big city to convince important people that something was wrong. When he came back, Appa said that important people in the big city didn't believe him and that we were on our own. So we sat around the school chalkboard starting to formulate ways that we could stop the crack from widening. First things first, he said, we have to stop throwing firecrackers down there because, because if someone on the other side got hurt, it would be our fault. I asked if we can't stop it from growing, what if we put a bridge over it? He said the bridge would break down as the chasm grew wider. Then I said, what about a tunnel, like a tube in the ground? And he said he liked that idea, but what if it collapsed? Then I said, what about a cricket ball? And Uppa looked at me, tilting his head like he when he wanted to learn more. And I said, like the stitching on a cricket ball that holds it together. I tossed him one and Uppa caught it midair, bouncing in his hand. That's when he called me a genius. And that was the proudest I ever felt. I'll stop right there. Mm. Yeah, well, you're, you're a wonderful magical realist, really, Vikram. I've read others' works of yours, and we'll have some in next year, too. Um, I hope your day job helps you, allows you to keep writing. Yeah. <laughs> so talented and imaginative. And I know Thank you, you so much. Later for push cards, et cetera, right? Kim, Kim Hecko is a bilingual teacher, cancer survivor, fumbling surfer, and mom to a teen, in her own words. She's a terrific writer who uses writing to reflect on the struggles and wonder of her students and to explore the complexities of life. And these are young elementary students at school, especially around the edges. She came to Santa Cruz 35 years ago to go to college and as often happen, happens, never left. And uh, uh, so happy to have Kim Hecko reading. Everybody, um, I'm just, Wow, this is so exciting. I, I came a few years ago and read and I was so nervous and I thought, oh, I'll be less nervous at home, but I am a little this much less nervous. So I've been a um, school teacher for a long time and I teach first grade and this is a, the beginning of an essay I wrote about a student of mine who I had a, um, a couple of years ago and then I've changed the kids' names and um, I'll just read what I have. 
<clears throat> it's called Samuel's Angel. Samuel brings me gifts wrapped in scrunched up colored paper or sealed in plastic bags. <clears throat> Four walnuts in their shells, an old magic eight ball, a rock he decorated with markers and drawings. They are wild scribbles, swirls of color, each with a story, tornadoes, earthquakes, rainbows. He is very patient with me when I ask him to repeat what he has said. Speech therapy is helping, but still I have a very hard time understanding exactly what he is trying to tell me. The stories he tells me about the pic his pictures spill out quickly and are, are too often lost to me in their speed and in the animation of his voice. Samuel stopped speaking entirely when he was three. The kind of chemotherapy he was being given not only interrupts development in the language center of the brain, also it affects the muscles around the mouth and jaw to such an extent that making and pronouncing sounds becomes belabored and even impossible. He did not begin to speak again until he entered kindergarten, and then his words were halting, unintelligible, and few. By first grade, the words were flooding out of him, stories, ideas, observations. In the midst, midst of words slurred, truncated, poorly pronounced, pajajo for pajaro, a few big words, terremoto, which means earthquake, tor tor tornado, leucemia, which is Spanish for leukemia, come out with precision, as if he was sculpting them with his tongue before letting them out, like they were living things he had been holding in his mouth. When I heard that there was a boy coming to first grade who had had leukemia, I didn't want him. <clears throat> I told myself it was because I, if I got sick again, it would be traumatizing for him, which, although true, wasn't the real reason. I didn't want him because I couldn't bear to look into the face of a six-year-old who had been in treatment since he was barely three who had seen more of the inside of hospitals and clinics and doctor's offices than a park or the beach. A child who had been poked by needle after needle so often that it might have stopped hurting after a while because it became so normal to feel pain. <clears throat> I couldn't bear having to look into the eyes of the mother who had to hear that her three-year-old had cancer. The eyes of a mother who had to sit with her child in endless waiting rooms watch as his skin was pierced over and over, as poison was injected into his small, still developing body, week after week, for three years. So I'll just stop there. So no coronavirus and no um, fires, but still sad <laughs> topic. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I can testify that it's a great story and all the other editors here can, can do the same thing. It's a, I guess what we call creative nonfiction. Yes. Okay. I'll call it that. Okay, Sounds good. I, whatever. It's an essay, <laughs> but it's more than an essay. So Samuel's Angel and uh, we're nominating that one for a pushcart prize. We loved it so much. So. Okay. And then, um, uh, Linda Lappin taught English at San Jose State University after graduating with her MFA and publishing Not Far From the Tree, a collection of poems. Uh, Craving is her first flash fiction to be published. She currently volunteers and is on the board of Recovery Cafe San Jose and lives in Japantown. And I'm excited to welcome Linda. Thank you. Thank you. Mine's uh, mostly a lighter topic. Um, it's about craving. <laughs> and I think, I think through COVID and the isolation, we're getting a taste of this. It's six o'clock when I leave the diet club with next week's meals. Oops, that should be you. I changed it from I to you at one point. Uh, with next week's meals, all three for every day of the next week in a little bag with a handle like a purse, a whole week hanging from one hand. And it costs you way too much, but you don't know what else to do. Even now, you feel anxiety rising. Check you wrote for this stuff may, may not even clear. Your bank account's getting thinner while you thicken up like a sequoia. It's a new ring for every season. The wide rings represent rainy season. 
This has been a really rainy season. As you pull away from the parking lot, the car in front of you stopped suddenly. You slam the brakes on and see with relief that there was no one on your bumper. Then you notice your week of meals fell out of the bag. All those shiny packages, most of them about the size of your fist. That's what they say. A meal should be about the size of your clenched fist. Your fist is clenched on the steering wheel. Relax, calm myself, calm yourself. You miss your old cat who died last week. And though your company downsized you into the unemployment line, the job market will pick up soon. The market, hmm, food, hmm. You are, you are kind of hungry. What's that on the floor? A packet of cookies. Oh, how good that would be right now. Just a cookie, a tiny little treat. As you continue home from the fat club meeting, you recall that moment on the scale. Why do they have to use a digital scale that goes out four places? You'd be okay as hell knowing your weight within a few pounds. Meanwhile, you recall that tiny cookie across the car on the passenger side door floor. How good that cookie would taste right now. You lean and stretch, but you can't quite reach it. And the impatient creep behind you honk the instant the light changed. The light changed the instant you stretched across your console and almost snagged the cookies. You glare through the rear view mirror as you pull away from the light. Ha! Ah, you run the next damn light and make a hard left into the intersection, hoping the cookies will slide your way. And they do. You don't know what street you're on, but you've got the cookies within reach. And now in your hand, you see you're so small, just two black quarters wrapped in child proof plastic. No amount of pulling and tearing breaks the seal, tears well up. You give them one last yank and blam, the plastic bursts open and they fly out one in your lap and the other on the dash. You just want a cookie. You've worked hard your whole damn life and you just want a goddamn cookie. Now you've worked yourself into a state Steers streaking to makeup you struggled with earlier for an interview. Maybe the interview went well, who knows? But right now, you've got that first cookie in your mouth and it is so good. A little childlike voice in your head whispers that it would be even better with vanilla ice cream. You know they didn't put that in the bag. But hey, there's a Safeway right over there. And again, you swerve just a little erratically into the parking lot. This causes another cookie to slide your way. Then, as you pull a handicap, pull into a handicap spot right in front, whoop, flashing light startles you. What? You imagine that the fat police will drag you out of your car and breathalyze you, at which time you will fill the tube with cookie crumbs. And they will slap you in handcuffs right in front of all those normal looking people gathered on the curb. You think all this, and more as the officer approaches your car cautiously because by now you may look a bit wild-eyed. However, what the officer sees when she asks you to roll down the window is a pitiful makeup streaked woman, woman offering, offering the officer a cookie instead of a driver's license. Okay. No, I was not arrested. I was just told to seek counseling. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I, just, I, you know, it's, it's, it's so much about driving in America, isn't it? <laughs> well, eating and driving. Yeah. 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 I mean, everybody has their odd ways of using the car. It's also <laughs> about eating. Uh, thank you. That's wonderful, and it's really great to hear you read it. Helene Simkin Jara is an actor, director, author, and educator who lives and works in Santa Cruz. Her work has been published in the Porter Gulch Review, La Revista, Mind Prints, Frenzy, Serving House Journal, and Nerve Cowboy. She's a fabulously gifted writer, fiction, memoir, plays, and even poetry. And I've seen her act in Jory Post's new play, and it was a revelation. So welcome, Helene. Thank you. OK, I'm going to read part of this um, uh, C plaque. On her first day at the dental office, there were balloons and flowers for her and a raffle in which she entered and won. To her consternation, it was a ticket to a cage diving expedition. She'd never spent much time in the ocean, let alone dive. And as she envisioned the hammerhead sharks floating by with their giant teeth, she couldn't help but wonder if their teeth had hideous plaque on them. 
But Marcella knew what to do. If she had a panic attack, she would just brush her teeth to calm down. No one would notice, she surmised. As she checked in with the instructor on the day of the expedition, she was appalled at his demeanor, patronizing, self-congratulatory, and paunch-bellied. Well, little lady, he began grinning with a toothpick in his upper right bicuspid. Marcella quietly was disturbed by the discoloration of his teeth. She clutched her toothbrush, which was in her purse, as he droned on about the rules. Don't get near the bars. Always wear your mask, blah, blah, blah. After changing into her wetsuit, she snuck her toothbrush into the sleeve. To her great dismay, the other two participants did not show up. Being alone with this tool was gonna to be as bad as having to be surrounded by sharks underwater. Why me crossed her mind more than once. As they lowered into the Pacific Ocean just off the coast near Palmdale, Florida, and she watched the annoying gestures of the insufferable human pointing to his whiteboard and grease pencil, her regulator mask and the bars, she tapped her left wrist with the aforementioned, aforementioned toothbrush several times, assuring herself of her escape from insanity. And then there they were, a school of hammerheads bumping into the bars of the cage. Oh my God, their teeth, crusty, filthy. Do they ever brush their teeth with kelp? Marcella felt her breath quicken as she turned away from the buffoon next to her, too close to her. Crouching down, she pulled down her regulator, held her breath and whipped out her toothbrush, frantically brushing up, down and sideways. She felt a tap on her shoulder. As she straightened up and turned towards the man, he was agitatedly waving his arms, pointing to her regulator. She ignored him, continuing to brush her teeth. He then resorted to pulling out his whiteboard and writing with his grease pencil, put your regulator back on now. Marcella inched to as far away as she could from him, bumping into the bars. This sent the hammerheads into a frenzy and the instructor scribbling yet again on the whiteboard, stop bumping into the bars, dangerous. Marcella felt the cage being hoisted up to the surface, the wet suited oaf ignoring her. She placed her regulator calmly back on her face, grateful to being, to being able to breathe again and reinserted her toothbrush into the sleeve of her wetsuit. As the instructor held out his hand to help her get out of the boat, he refused to look at her. He'd taken off the head of his wetsuit, his lips set in a tight line. You young lady have bro broken serious rules. You endangered not only yourself, but me as well. I'm going to recommend that you never be allowed on an expedition like this ever again. Marcella inspected his teeth as he pontificated. She considered giving him her card, but she thought better of it and only nodded. She tried unsuccessfully not to smile. After peeling off her wetsuit and changing into her street clothes, Marcella breathed a sigh, whipped out her toothbrush, vigorously trying to erase the last hour of her life off her teeth. When she came into work the following Monday, the employees all gushed at her. How was it? Was it thrilling? I'll stop there. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Yeah, well, the, this, this flash fiction and prose in this section of the magazine is, is funny and lively. And then we'll hear Carol Park now. It's a little sociopolitical in a good way. And you know, we're all tired after two hours, but so you gotta, you gotta get the book and check it out when you're fresh. That's a wonderful story you wrote it. It's kind of magical realism, but maybe it could happen. So I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you. So um, the immensely talented Carol Park loves exploring geographies, internal and external, far and near. Her homes have ranged from the San Francisco suburbs to mazes of Japan, from Hawaiian sands to wilderness of redwoods and pines. Her fiction, um, ranges far and wide. So this is Carol Park and welcome. Thank you. The germ of the story I read comes from a true tale um, from my tutoring of a student in English as second language. And I know how difficult it is to speak another language because when I lived in Japan, I just petrified of speaking with someone I don't know. So with that 
forward, let me tell my tale. You, you call them drips? I hear the blossom vessel is on. Carl held a cell phone to his ear and spread his big bone frame on his office chair, nearly filling his superintendent's cubbyhole of the aging apartment complex. Hey, let's ride our bikes to Fresno Friday, proposed Rob. Yeah, early is good. People call my cell anyways. Meet me at the usual, two o'clock. You got it. Carl clicked off and handled emails. 12% late penalty, he typed back to a tenant. Then he walked the grounds. Shrubs needed trimming and a dead squirrel lay under one. Akiko in apartment 139 noticed a drop from the ceiling as she scrambled eggs for breakfast. Okasan, Mite, her son Kotaro called her. Look, Ite, look. She waited for him to repeat the English word before she admired what he'd done. That's good. She hoped bits of English would help in preschool. She put Kotaro in his high chair and wiped the drips coming from the joint between ceiling and wall. When her husband Shingo came down, she pointed them out. I'll call the super tonight, too early now. He was the one who did such interactions. People's impatience with Akiko embarrassed her. Shingo hurried off for his research job and Akiko revisited the watery wall in between scrubbing, sweeping, and answering Kotaro's demands. She timed the drips. Every 15 minutes, 10. Then 15 drips. Then a new place leaked. She positioned cookie sheets where drips fell and took her son for a walk in the stroller. On returning, more water, but she didn't want to disturb Shingo at work. When he returned that night, he called the super and got voicemail. This is Nakata, apartment 139, water drips on the wall. When Carl arrived Friday morning, he tended to an angry tenant, checked the grounds and heard the voicemail. Only drips, he thought, I've got a lot to do before 1.30 and it's a job for someone else. The plumbers he called promised to come on Monday and he left a voicemail with the Nakatas. He decided not to drop in on Mrs. Nakata because he knew he made her nervous. Soon it was time to go meet Rob. When Shingo arrived at 8 p.m., Akiko barely greeted him. On seeing the three foot spread of ceiling seam where water seeped through, he asked, didn't the super come? No, he just said plumbers on Monday. Shingo got only the super's voicemail. More water, please come soon. He shook his head. He's a fool, Akiko agreed. On Sunday evening, Carl brooded over Shingo's second message. There was a hint of urgency, but no panic or anger. Carl decided to wait till work hours. At 9 a.m. Monday, Carl rang the door. He stepped around cardboard boxes piled with toys, towels, and books before entering the kitchen. A flood fell from five feet of ceiling. He cursed. How did it get this bad? Drips Thursday, Friday more, Saturday more and more, Sunday waterfall. Kotaro stuck a finger through the wall. Shit, said Carl, imagining the owner's fury. Excuse me, asked Akiko. Sorry, I swore. I want to learn the word for mad. I say sheet, right? No, more like shit. Both Akiko and Kotaro repeated, shit. And Carl found room for a chuckle. <laughs> this really happened to my student. She was ignored. Yes, it's a, it's a witty, funny, concise flash about the dehumanization of the landlord system, isn't it? <laughs> and also about how Americans expect, expect people express motions loud and vocally. If they don't, yeah. they think it's nothing, no big deal. Yeah, so you're, you're from a marginalized position or language situation and you're gonna, you might not get served. <laughs> so anyway, thank you for sharing and it's great to meet you. And it's a wonderful story called Drips and you'll see it in, in its entirety at the end of the, in the magazines. Finally, for the flash fiction section, and I think we just have three poems after that. Suzanne Helfman was, was a retired Bay Area Community College and English instructor. Um, she writes and reads and walks on the California Central Coast. She's retired now, isn't she? She looks forward to the brighter year ahead, don't we all? And I'm very happy that 
Suzanne is here. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. I'm um, going to read the first section of a flash piece called Home. Your mother's a malcontent, asserts my father, when I give him the news that mom just split from her third husband. My father was number two, on the heels of her brief, and to hear my mother tell it, foolish starter marriage. I know my father is secretly pleased that this one didn't work out for her either. It means that he wasn't the one who was defective. What was it this time, he probes. I don't know, something about a homeless person sleeping in front of their house. They weren't married very long, less than a year, but this one was supposed to be it, third time's the charm and all. He was a friend of a friend, recently widowed, solvent and housebroken. He didn't drink, didn't smoke, and appeared to adore my mother, showering her with jewelry and exotic trips. I was just glad that she was sufficiently occupied that she no longer needed to text me 20 times a day. I didn't have strong feelings about Jeff one way or the other. Of all the guys named Jeff she dated, he was probably the least objectionable, but it's not like I was looking for a stepfather or a buddy. And I was on to the fact that any guy dating my mom who was friendly to me, pouring on the tickets to ball games and the good scotch could turn on a dime once the courtship phase was over. The Jeff before this one sold me a vintage Mustang convertible for way below Kelly Blue Book, only to ask for it back when mom called off their engagement. So I kept it light, I kept it loose. As the story goes, mom and the current Jeff got home late one night from a trip to Spain and Portugal luggage and presents in hand to see this homeless guy, or maybe it was a woman, that part isn't completely clear, asleep on the bus stop bench in front of their house, swollen feet sticking out from the ratty blanket covering his or her face and body. Oh my God, says mom in her telling of it. Followed by, the, by a what the fuck from her beloved Jeff. Apparently, the homeless are supposed to be invisible in their upscale suburb. He, she was gone by the next morning, but her shoes, dirty pink Adidas without laces, were tucked below the bench along with her blanket and a pile of fast food wrappers. So Jeff reported, or so Jeff reported after he scooped them all up and tossed them into the trash. No way, Monica, my mom protested. Those shoes belong to somebody. And what she's supposed to use for a blanket now. Maybe she should have thought of that before making our front yard her storage locker. And then all hell broke loose, if you believe Monica's version of the story, which I do and don't. She hasn't always been the most reliable narrator. Where is she supposed to sleep, Monica wanted to know. Not my problem. You'd think two adults in their 50s who'd seen their share of relationships might have a way to navigate such differences. Nope. Even though they were jet lagged and travel weary, neither of them thought to say, wait a minute, let's sleep on this. Monica, who's never been especially slow to anger, started by throwing all of Jeff's shoes into the trash. So maybe he could grow a little empathy. Fat chance. Jeff tore all of Monica's favorite blankets off the bed and went to sleep in his Airstream parked on the side of the house. If you ask me, they deserve each other. And yet it appears mom is alone again, an old sad song. Sometimes I worry that she'll try to move in with me. The two of us wouldn't last a week in my studio apartment. I don't know what will become of her. She talks about moving to Seattle or LA it's enough to drive me back to Tinder, to meet up, to hiking with friends of friends. She's got more shoes than anyone could ever need, but she's not exactly at home in the world. I'd like to say, not my problem, but of course, it's not that simple. And for the second half, you'll have to read Red Wheelbarrow. Thank you. Yay. And a wonderful second half it is. I can attest to it. Beautiful reading. Thanks, Ken. Um, I'm, I'm putting the how to how to get a hold of the book 
uh, both as a PDF and as an actual print book um, in the chat. Beautiful reading. So we have three poets left. Um, and we're going to start with David Sullivan because he has to uh, I think pick up his daughter or something. So, um, and then we'll have Farnaz uh, Fatemi and then Charles Atkinson, uh, the saints who are going at nine o'clock. And so uh, just to introduce David Alan Sullivan, he's reading translation. So um, he, he's a distinguished Santa Cruz poet laureate and uh, now and, and ed, distinguished editor and translator as well as poet. Um, and he's translated many poets of Iraq and Syria. Uh, and he'll read tonight uh, um, the poetry of the Iraqi poet Amal al Juburi, if I pronounced it correctly, who has written many books, including Hagar Before the Occupation, Hagar After the Occupation, and published by Alice James. So the poems included in Red Wheelbarrow, translated by David, who visited Amal in London, so they're co translated are from the manuscript Tattoo the Torah on My Eyelids. Amal lives there in London with her son and visits Iraq regularly to work with children overcoming trauma through creating poetry and art. I'm always honored to have David share his translations and his poetry tonight, his translations with us. David? Thanks, Ken. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, people, for sticking around this long. Pranaz and Charles, sorry, I'm going to miss you guys. Um, so these are, yeah, these are co-translations. I do not speak Arabic. Um, Amal's English is quite good, so she could do English versions of it. And then we met for about a week in uh, the London Public Library. And um, she rented a place for me to stay in London, which until I got to London, I didn't realize what a gift it was. London is expensive now. <laughs> um, anyway, so this is one that we worked on together and I'll just read one poem. It's called its water is in our blood. And it's kind of a love poem to Baghdad from London. Tonight, we drag the Euphrates here and realize Baghdad can morph into a traveling city of departures. That the diaspora can settle into train stations stolen from our fates. The prisoners are flowers that carry the aroma of empty spirits. Jump back 2,600 years to our homeland of exiles, our homeland that became our haven, suspended between thieves and dictators. Raski flowers are white robed orphans that celebrate water and dance dew to the roof on mornings when we sleep there. We descend at dawn before the sun kisses us, descend to beds of desire and continue in sleepiness in the smell of wet dust that flows from the taps of our homes. There, in the Jewish district of Batawin, or in the orchards of Karada, near Violet's brick palace of a house, or behind the home of Ellen and David Kalashki, behind Uncle Daniel's, we sleep on, see seemingly forever. We want to collect all the flowers, all the sighs of all the gardeners, all the male lovers sighs as they surreptitiously nibble on their women's lips, safe from religion and norms and laws. Rusky petals escape silently to the banks of the Tigris. They listen to the shy scuff of our footsteps, to the sighs escaping from Iraqi prisons that sail with us. When we're there, we cry for the Euphrates to carry us here. And when we're here, we cry for the imprisoned Euphrates, drained by injustice and sadness, domesticated by the prisons of turbaned extremists to carry us there. We cry for the river, but we can't cry on its shores. We cry because its water is in our blood, flows from here to there, from there to here. We cry because captivity is pillowed with soft tears in our auctioned homeland. So why, when we talk of love, do we return to the destruction of the temple, to this betrayal? I told you, this is Baghdad. I wish I could wrap myself in her, embrace her, so the rain could tap into me God's messages in semaphore. When I touch the Thames, I touch the Tigris, but my fears for Iraq push my head underwater. It's not just you, not just the Euphrates, 
not just the rescue flowers, not just the security, not just the wishes, but everything, every single thing, all of it sinks into silence. Wow. Sorry, I have to leave. I'll, I'll catch you on the YouTube <laughs> recording later. Take care, everybody. Wonderful night. Congratulations, Ken and everybody. Yeah, this was this this is almost as long as a Porter Gulch review uh, reading. <laughs> <laughs> we got to both work on that. <laughs> Take care. Thank you for sharing that with us. And there's another one of her poems in the book. Yeah. Thank you, David. Uh, so two poets left who are heroes uh, for, and definitely last but not least. You know, this is the epitome of that cliche. So, last but not least, we have Farnaz and and Charles. Lisa's not here, is she? Mm. I mean, Lisa, Lisa Ortiz. Could not make it. She could not make it. So um, uh, Farnaz uh, Fatemi is an Iranian-American poet, editor, and writer, teaching in Santa Cruz, California. Uh, and she's a member and co-founder of the fabulous Hive Poetry Collective, which has resuscitated the great radio poetry presence in Santa Cruz. She's been publishing her poems widely recently, including in the anthology, My Shadow is My Skin, Voices of the Iranian Diaspora. Her poem uh, in this volume, Bee Leaf, spelled B-E-E -E and then L-E-A-F, is for Kathy Chetkovich. Thanks, Ken. Thanks everyone for being here still. Bee Leaf. We bring charades for your birthday. Broad daylight, your house. You two at your door, the two of us quarantined at your rose bush, a jar of vodka and tonic on the sidewalk so I can toast you. I've heard in Sweden that birthday gifts receive, birthday guests receive the gifts instead of giving them. And that's what I remember as I stand here gesticulating to get you to guess the name of a Danielle Steele novel. We are so bad, I am laughing tears. When it's your turn to act, you mime a rake on your concrete porch, which now holds anything that comes to me. Dirt, rose, farmland, seeds, rain, as they fall from your sweetheart's arms. I see it, he shows us. I shout it out a dozen times. He is a scarecrow and then he is Rapunzel. And then we are with a hundred people figuring out how to live off the land. Isn't that it? You are striking out and I will follow because you are making me smile. You don't fret about the neighbors or about my inability to gesture more precisely. And you love that I throw myself into these games and I love that you let me. I see you for days an after image of abandon, you willing me to see what you're raking as he gestures over and over, making the curves from which the thing is falling, the thing we're all looking at together, unwilling or unable to say its name. Thanks. Thanks. All right, so it's a charades poem, but also a friendship poem and, and a beautiful one. And, and uh, it's fun to, to end the reading with uh, things like friendship and uh, and then with Charles Atkinson who reads last, I guess today, uh, we have also um, family and, and grandchildren. Charles Atkinson has won several significant national chapbook competitions. He's also published two full length collections with Hummingbird Press, Fossil Honey and This Deep In and two chapbooks, World News, Local Weather and Skeleton, Skeleton Skin Joy from Finishing Line Press. He also is in love with his granddaughter, Eloise. And welcome Charles Atkinson, one of the great poets of Santa Cruz. Oh, you're muted. There. Okay. Keep talking, Ken. I'd love to hear that. <laughs> What an evening, really. This has been this is, this is some extraordinary art and um, writing going on here. So cool to hang out. Um, the poem I'm going to read tonight is part of a growing series um, <clears throat> of a precocious and unusual grandchild. 
and it's a, a benediction for her. Uh, this is a two-year-old, by the way. The title is called um, In No Time, which I realized afterwards has multiple meanings that are really quite contradictory. Um, mm. So in no time, grown-up kids return with kids, lives that hurtle by. This body bends to sit with a grandchild calloused hands grown shiny. Eloise, it's on a flower. It's a monarch. What's it doing there? Eating nectar? Why does it do that? Make it strong. I saw it Tuesday. She pages back a lifetime to a day last week called Tuesday. Adore this tiny adult and hope. May you wander, chase an unnamed butterfly, cajole it, hold out a finger. When it will not land, let it stagger, clear the fence, be gone. I see this as a, a benediction for us poets and artists uh, as well. When it will not land, let it stagger, clear the fence, be gone. Ken, thanks for your extraordinary work. Um, brilliant editing that creates that magazine every year. It's just stunning to see it. So thanks for that gift. What about your brilliant poem? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so many poems about Eloise, who, who had the audacity to move to the East Coast. Yes, yes, I'm furious. <laughs> <laughs> Good yeah. night, everyone. Yeah, well, so Thanks we're hanging in here night right now, and Rob might have some closing things to say. Oh. Um, so we'll kind of stay here, but that was the last poem. I wanted to, I put in the chat the way to buy the book or download it. If you have any questions, I'll stick around. Uh, and Rob, do you have anything to say? Thank you all for, for coming tonight. Thank you to Works San Jose, Joe Miller for co-sponsoring this event and Poetry Center San Jose later this month with uh, Michael Miller, San Jose Poetry Slam. And uh, we also have Kelly Grace Thomas with Connie Post featured at the third Thursdays at Willow Glen Library Reading Series uh, this month, third Thursday, 7 p.m. Look forward to that and um, hope to see you again next year here with Well Read featuring Monica Sook and uh, Sharon Coleman. Wonderful work, great words, great visual art, Ken, always a pleasure. And Many, many thanks to the readers, Daryl De La Cruz, Stephanie Stein, Cesar Kent, Cynthia White for many, many hours of reading. It was actually a great pleasure and I missed, I, I'm like in uh, withdrawals from that. <clears throat> you talked about prize winning readers, the prize screeners who read 2,500 poems. Yes, the, the readers read uh, well over 2,000 poems, uh, 2,500 over. Uh, it was great nights of conversation and deliberation. Uh, many thanks to them. Many thanks to Ken for, uh, you know, uh, pushing this uh, project our way and working with us. And um, Lita Kurth just went away, but Lita helped us find the flash fiction. And she has a beautiful flash fiction forum in San Jose. And um, helped edit the fiction this year. And Caesar Kent, who just had bad, you know, has roommates who used up all the, uh, all of his um, Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> and all of you who joined us tonight. So next year, Rob, we're going to be in an actual room and do this. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Poetry Center San Jose. Congratulations, Ken. Thanks, Rosie. It was wonderful. And uh, thank you, Gary, for, uh, you know, uh, folks, uh, Gary uh, up in Santa Cruz with the fires and- Very young. 
and the many tragedies up there. Uh, thank you for participating and giving your soul to this uh, project, your loving kindness here. My uh, pleasure, Rob. And uh, go easy and uh, wishing you well up there. Thank you. You get to move back in soon, don't you? Hopefully by Christmas. And it, it'll, the place is okay, right? No, it's, it's, it, it's, it'll be habitable by Christmas. We'll be working on it probably until this time next year. Oh, yeah. yeah. What about water anyway? We have water. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed Ellery stayed the whole time too. Ellery, are you still there? Ellery Akers? Yeah, she's here. She's right <laughs> underneath you <laughs> in the square. I just want to thank you for staying the whole time and what a, what a thrill it was to read your book and think about your work. I hope everyone buys your book. <laughs> oh, well, thanks. And God, it's so great. It's so great. And Gary Young is one of my absolute favorite poets of all time. I, I really, your books are worn to threads. They're so threads. <laughs> so. <Right. laughs> so. And thank you, Ken, for everything. This was great. Yeah, you know, in a way, Gary and Ellery, you, you, you both are so, you're so able to, uh, to say a lot in a few words and you probably enjoy seeing each other's craft. <laughs> Gary, 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 somehow, yeah, fact, holds, yes. <laughs> how, do, how does Gary hone his poems down so small? I don't know how he does it, mm. but, they, but they contain everything. Yes. <laughs> He's a Taoist. See you, Ellery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank Good you. Charles. Good to see you. You too, Gary. We have to come here to do it. All right. Yeah, you know, I, I'm going to.